Uh, Desmond Lund is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and a member of the Center for Computational and Integrative Biology at Rutgers University. His research interests are synthetic biology, systems biology, biological signal processing, and network science, and he's currently working on a project to alter the genetic makeup of E. coli to produce biodiesel fuel derived from fatty acids. Prior to his present position, he was an associate professor in the School of Mathematics and Statistics and director of the Phenomen uh, Phenomics and Bioinformatics Research Centre at the University of South Australia. From 2006 to 2008, he was a computational biologist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and a research fellow in genetics at the Harvard Medical School. So a man with a very distinguished pedigree, please welcome Desmond Lund. All right, thanks very much, Alan. Um, so Claudia's given a very good overview of synthetic biology, um, and in particular, she mentioned these revolutions that we've been through, these um, industrial and information revolutions, and we're all sort of personally familiar with the information revolution. And in fact, there are many similarities between what's happening now in biology um, and the information revolution that we've all experienced, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that comes about. So, um, so first of all, so what is synthetic biology? Well, Claudia talked about this, but here's a, just another perspective where what we can do is we can um, think about what's happening in biology in analogy to computers, which is something that you know, we're somewhat more familiar with. Um, so this, uh, here are a couple of quotes from a recent uh, journal paper reviewing the state of synthetic biology. Um, and what you can see here is that the authors of this paper have highlighted that synthetic biology is about engineering, um, and it's also extending genetic engineering. So there are many similarities between synthetic biology and genetic engineering, but synthetic biology sort of takes genetic engineering to the next level because we're not so much thinking about inserting, say, a single gene into an organism, but rather focusing on systems of genes, so a whole collection of genes and how they work together. Um, so in any case, you can think about um, cells uh, in a way that's sort of analogous to computers. Now, computers are something that we've engineered for quite a long time, and we're quite good at it. Um, and you know, at the base level of a computer are these um, great things called transistors, and we put the transistors together in certain ways to make these gates, and then put those together to make modules, and eventually make up the computer. And you can think of a cell in a very similar way as a computer, um, where instead of having these transistors at the bottom layer, we have genes, which are sort of strings of DNA that do certain things. They're used to make proteins, then carry out uh, biochemical functions. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, the, the main difference between cells and computers is that you know, we made computers, but cells were engineered by nature. Um, and we didn't really know how that came about. But now we're beginning to unravel how, that, how that's happened. And we can start thinking about building up cells using the same principles that we've used to build other complex systems like computers. So why do we want to do this? Well, um, there are many, many applications. And Claudia's touched upon a few. So she's talked in particular about um, the bioenergy applications um, and also the applications in drug production. So we can make artemisinin. We can also make a whole lot of other things like antibiotics and anti-cancer agents. Um, there's also biomaterials, bioremediation. So I won't talk about these in too much detail, but um, some of the most exciting applications are in biomedicine. Now, these are quite a long way off. But um, rather than just using cells to make things, we can actually make cells be intelligent in some way, so they can actually respond to their environment in some sort of intelligent way. Um, and if we can have cells that do that, then we can start thinking about having cells that can, say, find the cancer that's in your body uh, and then activate a response that will kill those cancerous cells. Um, we can also think about having um, bacteria or viruses that can be used as infectious disease therapeutics. So, you know, we're often infected by these nasty bugs that are in nature. Um, and, but what we can start, or what we can think about doing is actually making bugs 
that can target those nasty bugs and go after them and, 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 um, and kill them um, as, they, as they infect us. Okay, so my research is also, uh, my personal research is also focused on, um, on fuel production. Um, what we're doing is, um, uh, rather than thinking about making biofuel from biomass, which is what mostly, what a lot of the biofuel work is about, um, so mostly people are thinking about making biofuels from, say, sugar, which is derived from a plant or from a grass, or they're thinking about growing up algae and then converting these algae uh, into, into biofuel. What we want to do is to engineer an organism that can directly take in sunlight and carbon dioxide and do all the work inside the cell. So within the cell, we carry out all the chemical reactions that will make a fully finished fuel, like biodiesel, and then just excrete it out into the surrounding media. Um, so uh, uh, the reason for doing this is to make it cheap, because what we need to do with fuel is that we need to make something which is cheaper than fossil fuel fuel if we want to if we really want people to adopt biofuels. Um, so we're, thought, we're thinking about direct biodiesel production, and to do this, we're doing this metabolic engineering that, um, uh, that's been talked about. Um, and there's another component, which is that we use computer design. Um, so a large part of my work is in building up um, computer design as being a fundamental uh, component of doing engineering of these cells. Um, so Biology for a long time has been what's called a wet science. We just uh, take cells and we do things to them. Um, but now there is this sort of dry component, this component that you do outside of the lab, which is becoming increasingly important. So rather than just looking at the system and then making changes to it, we can insert these steps where we model the system mathematically or model cells mathematically, and then we use a computer to design how we want the cell to behave and, and, and actually test it out in the computer before we actually go and make the cell. And as, as the engineering gets more complicated, this becomes increasingly important. Okay, so I talked about you know, computers as being an important part of, um, of, of what's going on. Um, and in fact, there are many ways in which these uh, computer technology and these, these biological technologies are linked. So just to put it in perspective though, this is, um, this is a plot which is showing something that we've all sort of personally experienced, or at least partially experienced. So computers, as, as we all know, have, has evolved very, very rapidly over the past several decades. So this is just a timeline going back 50 years. Um, and most of us uh, here weren't around at that time, but you know, you could have... <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, so at any rate, in that at that time, you could have bought um, one of these computers, which is shown in the bottom left-hand corner there. It's called a mini computer. Um, there's nothing mini about it. Uh, it's actually a very large thing that you put in. You know, you put in, put in like a corner of a room. Um, this was made by a company called Digital, which is no longer in existence. Um, but in any case, that would have cost you about a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and uh, it would be capable of doing about a thousand instructions per second. Um, and as many of you have probably heard, you know, your iPhone can do much more than that. Um, and in particular, say you can buy a laptop these days, it's about a thousand dollars, and that laptop can carry out about a billion instructions per second. So if you plot how many instructions per second you're getting per dollar, then you have on this, on this logarithmic scale, so this is a scale where um, as you go up by a constant amount, you're actually having a constant multiplicative effect. <coughs> and what we've seen is that the technology has improved nine, oh, sorry, n in nine orders of magnitude, which is one billion fold. So um, you're getting one billion times your bang for your buck. Um, and that's had all these profound effects that we've, we've all personally witnessed. What's less known is that DNA technologies have also been evolving in a similar way, but sort of under the radar, if you will. Um, so DNA sequencing's actually go, gone back a long way. Um, <coughs> but more recently, we've been able to sort of sequence human genomes, um, and, that's, uh, and, and this cost has actually been, been evolving in a similar way. DNA synthesis technology is the technology to make DNA sequences. So you come up with some sequence that you want to make, and you can actually make the molecule with that sequence. And that's also been evolving in this exponential way, and sort of under the radar, and we haven't really been aware of it. 
But <coughs> now, uh, these technologies are sort of coming to the fore. So um, this is just a couple of examples. So this is a press release by a company called Complete Genomics in California. Um, and what they are releasing is a product to sequence human genomes for $5,000 each. Now, to put that in perspective, the first human genome was finished in 2003, um, just eight years ago, um, and that cost about a billion dollars. It was a multi-billion dollar project. So in the space of six years between then and this press release, the cost has gone from a billion dollars down to several thousand. And so that's had, that, that's had completely, well, very profound effects, and effects that we will start to witness in the next five or ten years when personal human genome sequencing will become a very real thing. On the other side of that, we've been able to also make DNA sequences. So this is just a press release from the Venture Institute where they announced that they synthesized from scratch the genome sequence for a bacterium. And uh, so this is a bacterium with about a million base pair genome sequence, so about a million of these DNA letters long. They made that entirely from scratch and they put it into a cell. Now, at the moment, that's incredibly expensive. That's the only, that's the sort of thing that you can do if you're the Venture Institute and you have a lot of funding. But if these uh, trends that we've seen keep up, um, and there's no reason to think that they won't, then being able to do that will be um, in sort of the several thousand dollar price range will be in reach in about 10 or 20 years. And that will have this profound effect that so we can now very easily read the genome sequence of anything that we find in nature uh, to understand what the DNA sequences do, and we can very quickly make and cheaply make those sequences and put them into organisms, and that's having this, and, th and it's really these technology trends that's driving synthetic biology, and that will mean that synthetic biology will be a big science um, that will impact on our lives uh, in the near future. Thank you.